Hi again, this is Robert with Wealth Lab. And in this segment, we're going to finish up some more data concepts. We're going to create an ASCII data set, and then we're going to get an introduction to building block strategies and the settings. So let's get started with some, let's get started looking at a chart. Okay, and when you open a, a chart in Wealth Lab, you get a daily chart, that's the, that's the default. Daily is the interval right, of the, of the bars that are in the chart. So you can change the interval or the bar scale, as we call it, uh, right here. And the thing I want to mention here, because it's different in Wealth Lab, are the timestamps of intraday bars. In Wealth Lab, Wealth Lab uses the convention of end of bar timestamps, whereas almost everyone else, any other chart that you see anywhere else, will almost always have the start of the bar for the, for the timestamp. For Wealth Lab, it's, it's important for it to be the end of the bar for, uh, because it assumes that it assumes the end of the bar timestamp for filtering and scaling functions. So you can see that, um, for example, we have the start, the first bar of the day, first 30 minute bar of the day here is, if you look in the upper left hand corner, is 10 o'clock. The last bar of the day is a four, the 4 p.m. And of course, we're talking about the US market here. Now, one other thing that's different about intraday scaling in WellFlab are these hourly bars or 60 minute bars. So if you get a, if you look at a 60 minute chart, Wealth Lab uses the, the first hourly period after the open. So as you can see here, the, um, the first hourly bar after the open is marked 1030, not 10 o'clock, not on the hour. It's, it's the full hour period uh, after the open. And if you follow that through, it goes to the, the second to last bar is 3.30, and then the last bar is timestamp four, because that's, uh, that's the end of the day. Now, if the market, um, for example, if we, let's go over to a crypto provider. If we go to one of the cryptos, pull up a crypto in 60 minutes. Oh, sorry, that was my Apple that I added the, uh, before. Okay, but uh, you can see we're in the crypto market now. Now, cryptos is, is a 24-hour market. So their market opens essentially at midnight. Uh, now you can see that the, the timestamps of the bars, of these bars are actually on the hour because it's the first, uh, the full period from the, the open of the market is on the hour. Okay, so that's, that's important to know um, how the hourly bars, because a lot of people like to trade hourly bars. Now you don't have to think about the timestamps too much if you're using providers that are made for WealthLab. However, if you create an ASCII data source, you might have timestamps from another uh, provider that give you the, the start of the bar timestamps. But we have a way to change that. So let's go ahead and uh, set up an ASCII data source. So we're gonna create a new data set, select ASCII. Uh, let's just call this ASCII test. And we're gonna select a, a folder. I just happen to have this all set up. So that we're, I've got, I've only got one symbol, but when you create an ASCII data source, you wanna have all the, uh, the symbol names as the file name, and they all have to have the same extension, which it doesn't matter what they are. It could be CSV, TXT, however you like, but you just have to name it. If it's not one of these, you just type, type uh, whichever one, um, whichever file extension that you actually have, okay? What you typically do when you start uh, create your first ASCII data set is you open a file, uh, the file that you just pointed to, and so that, you, so that you can see the data and you can set up the fields. Now, um, generally, the, the field order is pretty standard for most people, for most providers, and date open, high, low, close, and it looks like that's the, that's the way it is here. Now, notice I have a my... Um, my ASCII data set has comma delimiters. However, there isn't a comma between the, the date and the time. Okay, so that's one field actually. So even though you might, even though you have a time field, it's actually part of the date. If you actually had a time field, I accidentally stopped the recording, so let me pick up where I left off. We are adding a time field, so we, 
add, add a field, select it here, time, drag it up to where the time would be. So we have date, time, and once again, that's if we were, um, if, if the date and the time were separated by a field delimiter. Uh, in this case, it's not, so we don't want the time field there, so we'll remove it. And, um, okay, we can continue configuring this um, ASCII data source. Uh, for header lines, there are no header lines. That would be like something that would say, open, identifying the, the columns there. Uh, same with footer lines, there are no footer lines. Now the date format, um, in this case, my date format actually is here. If, for example, you had a date format that what that didn't show up in this list, you can just type it in using the standard um, standard date time strings. So um, capital H for hours, lower M for minutes, capital M for months, and so on. Okay, so the time format isn't used. My decimal character is a period. And if you're not in the U.S., it would tend to be a comma. Um, Okay, and then we okay. This is if you're if you have fixed width, width fields, which we do not have. So we have delimited fields, and my delimiter my delimiter is a comma. Okay, so once I'm gonna here, I'm going to check to see if we got it set up, and if your data shows up there, it's set up correctly. But and since it's set up correctly, I'm going to save this format as um, as my standard ASCII format. We'll just call it my standard. So that way, you can see select a save format. If, if you, when you come back and set up an, another ASCII data set and it has the same format, you don't have to go through all that again. You can just select it there and the, all the fields will snap to the, right, uh, to the right selection. So we'll continue. And this is where I wanted to talk about adjusting the bar timestamps. If your ASCII data doesn't have uh, end of bar timestamps, here you can adjust it. So you select adjust the bar timestamps, and you can see how the uh, how the interval, which in this case is 30 minutes, is added to the to the timestamp of the bar. In my case, it's not um, my timestamps are correct, so we'll leave it as is, and we'll call this my uh, test ASCII set or something, my test ASCII, and we're finished. And you can see it, it shows up over here. And let's just open a chart, and that looks fine. Okay. Okay, so that's a quick lesson on how to set up an ASCII data set. Okay, let's get rid of that chart. We've covered charting, controlling data, and data intervals. Now it's time to introduce the tools we're going to use to create trading strategies, but first, we need to go over a few more concepts before we actually work with block strategies in the next lesson. All strategies start with one of three strategy window tools. So let's go up to the new strategy button and you'll see the top three are building blocks, C-sharp coded and rotation strategy. Meta strategy is a way to combine uh, any combination of the top three. And a trade history strategy is a way to analyze uh, a real trade history in Wealth Lab. So those are special cases. But let's open up uh, each one of these really quickly. And order these. Let's just put these so that you can see the difference really quickly. Okay, so these are three strategy windows. This first one is a rotation strategy. And you'll notice that it has four tabs. Strategy settings. Uh, rotation settings, backtest results, and chart. Now, this is the same, all of all the, the strategy windows have the same three tabs to start with, except this center tab that you can see is highlighted. So a rotation strategy has a, a rotation settings. Uh, the C-sharp coded strategy has a code editor. And the design surface has a nice organized block uh, design and this is the one that we'll mostly be working with at the, at, the, at first is the design surface for uh, block strategies and using the block strategy window let's do a little bit more orientation uh, using the strategy settings 
going over the strategy settings tab. And I want you to focus on the back test data section. Uh, we have a couple tabs there for a single symbol test and a portfolio back test. And I think it's a good idea uh, at first to just start with a single symbol. And down at the bottom here, you'll see save default for new strategies. And so that's a good place to, to that's a good setting to use for maybe new, when you're developing new strategies is just to start with one symbol. So I'm just, I'm going to click that so that we have a, a single symbol for the back test. Uh, a couple more things. The data scale is the bar interval that we're going to be concentrating on when we're developing strategies. And the data range, which you've seen before in charts. Let me open up a chart again really quick. Remember, in a chart window, if you click the date range here, you'll see the data range control. So that's the same control that we have in the strategy settings and also uh, the intervals up here in the chart. So in the strategy, when you're working with the strategy window, you control the scale and the data range right there. And the benchmark symbol is this, the instrument that we're going to run a buy and hold strategy on to compare how well your strategy did against the buy and hold for your benchmark. Let's not worry about the advanced settings now. Let's ignore position sizing for now and go back to our design surface and let's just run this strategy. It's actually a strategy uh, which just buys and sells every other day. And let's talk about two more concepts, signals and positions. You can see that when I ran this strategy, uh, another tab popped up with a signal. Now signals have properties associated with them. It tells you which symbol, which symbol the signal is for, the transaction type or the action is a buy. Uh, in this case, the quantity or the size of, of what you're buying, um, the order type, market limit stopped is the t type of order you're using. The order price, which in the case of a market order doesn't have a price because you're just buying at market on the next bar. Uh, a signal name. Now in the blocks, these are pretty generic names, but in a C-sharp coded strategy, you can make it very specific, but they're just generic names that don't really uh, affect how the strategy uh, operates. Signals are created after processing complete bars of data. So. The last bar of data that you processed is the date and or time of the signal. Okay, and uh, the account shows you the destination for the signal. And the weight is uh, a concept that we're going, I want to just mention the word now because it's going to be an important concept later when we talk about which signals we select uh, for trading. Now we use the term signals in um, two different ways. One is what you just see here. We're showing a signal, which is a, a, an alert to do to um, for a trade that needs to occur on the next bar. Okay, so that's a signal uh, which pops up in the signals tab. We also refer to these. Uh, let's go over to the building block strategies and fold this up. These entry and e exit blocks are also. We also refer to these as signal blocks, okay? So buy, sell, short, and cover are also, are what we call signal blocks. So those are the two uh, ways that we, for, we use the word signal. Now the neighbor just started with his leaf blower, so we're gonna cut this lesson a little bit short uh, in case there's a lot of noise in the background. Um, the, the last concept I wanted to go over was looking at the positions, now don't mind how all this occurred yet because we're going to get to that later, but when I ran the strategy, uh, the strategy actually ran a back test and created those buy and sell. Let's look at the chart. Uh, you can see all these buys and sells on every other day. And when I look at the positions tab, it gives me all the details of each position that occurred uh, in the back test. Now positions, in terms of the back test are always hypothetical. It's based on the data that you're feeding the back test, the data that's, for example, that's in this chart, and the type of signal. Um, and WealthLab tries to create positions in a realistic manner, but 
the important thing to know is that they're hypothetical. It's not real trading, okay? It's just that WealthLab determined that based on the data and the signal that that position could be filled uh, hypothetically. So once again, signals are actions that need to take place on the next bar and positions are hypothetical uh, in terms of a back test, they're hypothetical trades that occurred in the back test. And with that, we'll call it a day and we'll get to creating our first strategies with our first real back test strategies in the next lesson. Thanks for coming.